Hey guys, it's Bradley. Welcome back to my channel, Portly Gentleman. If you'd like to learn even more about home brewing and home brewing equipment, I would really appreciate it if you would subscribe and brew along with me. In today's video, I'm gonna share some tips and tricks with you to maximize the efficiency out of your brew tools brewing system. So hang on, it's gonna be an awesome video. Research it, mash it, boil it, ferment it, drink it, analyze it, share it, home brewing is good. First things first, at the end of the video, I'm gonna make some recommendations for optional brew tools accessories that I think really lend themselves to the most efficient brew day possible. Completely optional accessories, they'll be at the very end of the video. So if you're curious as to what I recommend, watch to the end. So there's so many factors into efficiency. I'm gonna try to cover as many as I can comfortably and stuff that I feel that I can speak about with some degree of knowledge. The number one thing is you need to know your brew tools brewing system. There are so many options when it comes to setups. My setup used to be kind of on the more extravagant, now it's on the low end, I think. How many feet of tubing are you using? Where is your chiller located? All of this is going to add up for losses within your system. How do you determine your system losses? This is something we should all do at least one time. I recommend fill your system up. It doesn't have to be full, but definitely get it uh, at least above the, the pump's kind of intake, and then pump out as much water as you can. When the pump stops kind of pumping, that's it. That's as much wort as you'll be able to get out. Hops do absorb and sequester some wort, so there will be losses from that. I'm not gonna get into it, but if you're brewing an extremely hop-heavy beer, you're gonna have more losses. Just like I said, all the hops are gonna sequester more wort. All right, so now it's actually pretty simple and straightforward. I'm gonna let you guys in on a little secret here. This is something I've been doing for my transfers for a long time now, since I transfer into my F-Series and my other unit tanks, I'm fully clean in place over here to my right. So I use a long piece of Brutus silicone tubing. I'll force that through the tubing with CO2 or oxygen, just depends on what I have available and how lazy I'm feeling. So the first thing you're gonna wanna do is, if you don't have the capability to push CO2 through it, that's okay. What you'll do is just unhook your tubing and catch whatever you can in some sort of a pitcher, and then you can either weigh it or just look at the volume. I'm not too particular, but a five gallon bucket is large, so put it in a five gallon bucket, having tear, torn the scale first, at which point you can weigh it, and then figure out your losses for your particular setup. Make sure everything is dry. Like I'm demonstrating is the easiest way is to go on to the pump inlet valve, put a T there, Pressurize that with, like I said, CO2. Arrange your valving in such a way that you're able to run through the entire pipework, chiller and everything and force all of the liquid out. Again, this is how I transfer wort into my fermenters these days. And honestly, the only losses I have are kettle losses. No other losses anymore. It's, it's literally negligible, anything that's left in my chiller. So honestly, chiller location placement, if you're doing this, doesn't matter. So remember that when you're setting up your system. Next up, grain crush. It is super important. It's gonna impact your overall experience, how long it takes you to brew, and the whole process. Recommended is 1.2 millimeters. Recommended means recommended. It's not gospel. You can literally do whatever you want. It depends on the malt bill. Um, you may not want to do certain grains that, that coarse even. You may wanna go finer, or you may want to go even coarser. It just depends on the malt bill. But really, make sure your crush is dialed in. The best way to do that is trial and error. Get it ballparked at 1.2 and start and see how, how the mash reacts, how it recirculates and how it sparges. So if you have an excessively fast recirculation and sparge, that may hurt your efficiency. You want the, the wort to kind of linger and percolate its way through the vessel as it's working. My advice is the next brew day, write down what you did and then increase or decrease the gap setting in your mill until you get it just so. Don't make a ton of changes at once. Take it nice and easy. This is a learning process. You have to know how to use your equipment. A good reliable mill is critical. I've done a review on the Millmaster mill. It is an awesome performing mill. I had great efficiency with that. I've currently been using the Blickman mill for three or four months. I'm getting ready to drop a review on that. So stay tuned, it should be interesting. Another thing to consider is the diastatic ability of your malt, meaning how many enzymes are gonna be in there and active. There are some malts like Mecca grade estate malts, really high diastatic power. Other maltsters and other malts 
may have much lower diastatic power. So if you're running into issues in just one certain brew, check with the homebrew store, figure out what kind of malt it was. All this stuff is readily available. You can figure out what you're working with. But this is another thing if you're having sporadic issues that could come into play. The next step in the efficiency road is recirculation. Recirculation can for some with a brutal system be one of the biggest struggles or for others just a breeze. I want to talk about water to grain ratio. The water to grain ratio within the Brewfather app, I personally don't care for the one that comes with it. Mine, I have mine at 1.4 quart pounds. That's where it's set. It works pretty well for me. Having said that, if I'm ever doing a particularly larger beer with more grain, I will often adjust that ratio so I can get a little bit more sparge. I find this helps in efficiency on a larger size brew. There is a sweet spot for efficiency within the three brew tools system sizes. I'm not gonna go into detail on each one, but there absolutely is a point to when you add a more grain, you're gonna to start to lose efficiency and there's not many ways around this. The only real way around this is to buy a bigger system. Sometimes I think I wish the 150 was available when I bought my B80 Pro, because honestly, if I wanna do a bigger beer in the volume I want to do on a 150, it would be much easier, but that's only a few times a year, so maybe it's worth it, maybe it's not, but that's a decision for you. I still do a 10 minute mash rest. I've really found that the mash rest helps me kind of set the mash and set the stage for a nice successful brew day. It's also time that I use to get other stuff ready, so I really recommend you do it. At the end of the 10 minute mash rest, I will take a pH rating to see where the mash is sitting at. pH being too low, too high can also affect efficiency. You wanna make sure you're within that sweet spot around 5.2%. Some beer styles want less, this is great, but just really, if you're really trying to dial this in, it's a thing you need to watch. I'll typically go, I'll check it at 10 minutes, and then I'll go another 10 minutes, check it again. If it still isn't there, I might try and adjust it after been mashing for 30 minutes, but by then it's usually pretty much on track. It's very important also to know the pH of the water that you're starting with. Stirring your mash. This is one, Sometimes I'm kind of hit or miss on whether I do it or not. I think it does help in certain instances. If you're brewing a very small beer, I don't think there's a need to stir. But if you're getting a larger grain bill in there, I think stirring does help. I also kind of think what's the point of a 10 minute mash rest if you're gonna stir you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes in. Having said that, I'll typically stir at 30 minutes and then maybe again at 45 minutes in, I'll give everything a good stir and then I won't touch it again. But that's only on beers that are a larger kind of grain bill. Stirring will definitely help you find some efficiency. This goes back to grain crush slightly, but you don't want recirculation to go too quick. You also don't want a ton of liquid, you know, coming off the top of, of, of your malt pipe that could create other issues down the road. We've all been there and had an element run dry for just a second. It's a pain in the ass to clean. So make sure that you're recirculating. Everything holds a nice level. You may have to modulate the lower valve there and change that position to control how much liquid you bypass from the center pipe and allow to recirculate around the outside of the kettle. If you guys are chasing efficiency and you're doing the same thing over and over again, you can't expect it to improve. You've got to pick one little part of your process and change that and see what happens. Maybe two little parts, but if you go crazy, you're just gonna get lost. So if you're doing the same thing, you can't expect to improve. Next, we're gonna talk about a Vorloff step. This is a step that, you know, We'll go back in time. I have some very early videos. I was trying to maximize clarity of my wart. So I basically send all of the wart up through the center pipe and down into the mash tun and let it percolate through. That was essentially a Vorloff. More recently, people are lifting it all the way up out of your kettle. I don't think that's necessary. Although if you have a hoist, it's super simple to do. So whether you've lifted it or you're doing it inside of your kettle, you will, I think, notice an improvement in clarity. Does that clarity of the wart actually matter in the in beer, I don't, I don't think so. But to each his own, if you like the look of it, if it makes you feel good, absolutely do it. Doing this for 10 minutes will really, really aid in clarity, I promise you. I've honestly been messing with the Vorloff step really consistently, well, consistently for me, for the past six to seven months. And I've found some interesting things. I've found that if I take a gravity reading before with my easy dents, and I take one after, there is usually 0.3% more sugars there after I've done the step. Now, honestly, I can't figure out if a good thorough sparge would have rinsed those sugars or not, but it's something to consider. It's still kind of in my mind up for debate whether or not this actually helps your all-in-one brewing system. Anyone with any other system, brew tools, 
anything, I'd really love to hear you guys try it. Let me know what you think. It might help the entire community move forward. That segues nicely into sparge. Sparge is another area where you're rinsing sugars from the grain. It's really critical to get this right. A good, slow, consistent sparge is where it's at. I know there's gonna be B40 users saying, I sparge by hand and it's fine. And honestly, on a B40, I would probably sparge by hand too. On a B80, it's pushing it. On a B150, no one's hand sparging unless something broke and it's, it's a bad day at that point. So a good slow sparge is absolutely the way to go. When sparging, if you're using the stock mash hat, it, it does tend to churn stuff up. It's not the end of the world. I made a lot of great beers with that hat before I improvised and do a manifold or just a straight piece of tubing. So there's many ways to do it. Just don't be too aggressive. You don't want a ton of water on top of the grain bed, but you also don't want too little. So make sure your sparge is as even and consistent as possible. If you should have to spin that mash hat or whatever you have on top, I say spin it a little bit by hand manually. It's not gonna hurt, but it's gonna help you chase efficiency. Next up, boil off rates. This is gonna help at the end of the day because the boil is pretty much the last thing you do with efficiency. How do you figure out your boil off rate? It's really simple. It's, it's so easy, we could all do it, e even I could do it. So fill up your kettle, it doesn't necessarily have to be full, although when I figured out mine, I filled it to the volume I was gonna use, and then put on it whatever you're gonna use. If you're boiling with just an open vessel, do that. If you have a steam hat, do that. If you have a condenser on top of it, do that. And then boil at the same power you would typically boil when you're boiling the wort, whatever that is, I'm usually with my setup around depending on the batch size, between 43 and 50% power. Once I'm boiling, I never use any more than that, even if I have my B80 maxed, but that's just me. There's my altitude and other environmental issues that could also impact that. So boil it for a half hour or a whole hour or 15 minutes, as long as you can see a measurable drop in the level, having recorded it when you started and recorded it when you're done, you can calculate how much you're gonna boil off within one hour, two hours, or 10 hours. It's that simple. But knowing your boil off rate for your circumstance and putting that into your software or writing it down and just knowing it is gonna help you chase that efficiency down. So I think at the end of the day, if you're having trouble with efficiency, and you've watched this video and you try all these steps, I think you should be able to get efficiency in the very high 80 percentile. Honestly, I can do 88% without even trying, it's just, comes really naturally, it's very satisfying. You will save some grain versus 88 versus 70. So you may get a couple extra batches a year if you even care about that. Personally, malt is cheap. Don't stress it guys, as long as you're having a lot of fun making beer, that's all that matters. We'll end it, it tastes good. But mostly that you enjoy it and you feel fulfilled from the hop. Next, we're gonna talk about some brew tools, optional accessories that I recommend. And I think I'm gonna list these in order of what I think is the most important to the least, although I honestly have them all. The first accessory is the laser cut filter. This thing is a nice piece of kit. It allows you to use one of the other accessories I'm gonna mention, so you have to have this to use a one that's kind of lower on the list, at least in my opinion. But the laser cut filter will honestly help with efficiency, it's gonna help with clarity, it's gonna help with a lot of things, it's well worth the money, and it's never gonna go bad, it's super robust. Next up, I would get as an accessory is the Brew Tool Steam Hat. This is going to control boil off. It's gonna allow you to boil with less power. It's gonna make the whole process a little less steamy, a little less power, which I think can actually add to some flavors in your beer if you're not looking to caramelize everything. So this is the one I would go with next. After that is the steam condenser. I'm not gonna pull it off the top of the B80, but that's the one I would go with next is the steam condenser. Again, less power, much less boil off. So you can, you're not gonna have as quite as many losses. You can get a little more volume out of your system. Not a ton, but it makes a difference and it's really an awesome piece of equipment and I don't know what I would do without it. Plus, if you have that, you definitely don't need an exhaust hood. You're gonna, mine typically will, in about a 60 minute boil, I'll wound up with about 12 gallons of water, most of that water being around 150 degrees, which is really good for cleaning. The next piece is the sparge manifold, and I've already changed my mind. This piece should be right after the laser cut filter. I really like this. It works super well. It helps me sparge efficiently. I've been using it in recirculation. If it does clog, just pop off the end caps and they'll clear right out. But honestly, it definitely works well, and it will help you, I think, chase down some efficiency, or at least make everything far more convenient. The next one is the Brew Tools overflow pipe. You will need the laser cut filter to use this, but this is just an overflow. So basically if the wart gets too high in your mash tun, it'll let it overflow. I put this one at the bottom because honestly it does work amazing 
I just don't use it much. Some people may use it every time. On a big beer, I am always gonna use this. If I'm filling up my mash tun or getting anywhere near, say, over 35 pounds of grain in there, I'm gonna use this. It's super beneficial on a batch that size. On smaller ones, I just don't feel the need. That's just me. I think it's something to do with the sheer kind of surface area that the B80's mash tun has. B40 may be different. Again, I don't have a B40, so I really can't speak to it. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching in the end. I really hope if you struggle with efficiency that you don't get down, that you keep brewing, you keep creating, and you keep drinking. Did I miss anything? Is there anything you don't agree with? Because it's okay, uh, just because I'm Bradley here doesn't mean I know everything and doesn't mean that my opinions are wrong. They very well could be. But having said that, remember, home brewing is good and I'll see you real, real soon. Oh yeah, this fucking thing, before I break it. All right, I'm gonna turn up a light for the thumbnail so it's not dark as fuck on my face. Watch, this time it's gonna work. Last time it didn't work, but I figured out the remote. I'm smart. All right. Whew, here we go. This is a good angle on me. I'm, I'm a big boy. All right, that's, that's a thumbnail. All right. I'm done. Drinking right out the hose. I got cotton mouth or something. I'm just going to... Mm -hmm. That's pretty good.